top 10 wrestlers that defined a generation and defined our hearts. We got 10 selections, five from me, five from Marcus. Marcus, you ready to do this damn thing? Yeah. All right, then let's go into it. My number 10, Marcus gets the odds this week, is going to be actually a cheat. Is, is, is the trio of Triple X. Uh, the archetypes, the, the, the true rivals of America's Most Wanted, low-key elite skipper and Christopher Daniels, three future Hall of Famers, three men that defined not just a company, but a style. Daniels is obviously the big name of the group. He's currently still wrestling at 50 years old in AEW. Elite Skipper had the highlight of the group, walking that cage just like he didn't give a damn. And Loki's now more known for telling people how to get around wearing masks because he's that guy. Him and Austin Aries must be best friends. Yeah, yeah. Loki, you should stay that Loki. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, it's good for your career, my friend. Marcus, number nine, who'd you got? Uh, for me, man, uh, well, you know the story. I said it several times, but I initially got into TNA because my uh, one of my good friends, childhood friends, told me about this guy named AJ Styles. And, uh, you know, I obviously started watching and got hooked. And was primarily watching for him, but then I, you know, also caught on the guys like uh, my pick here, Monty Brown. Okay, you scared me because I thought I was out of order. I was like, wait, 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 what? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, Monty Brown, man, he uh, he just he just had this aura about him. Like he, you know, once you saw him, I mean, he looked the part, and then he had this 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 off guard personality. And then we saw him in the ring; he was just savage with it. And uh, although it feels like he never reached his full potential there, um, he was somebody special to watch on that program every week. And he was, you know, had a lot of good momentum with himself. So. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you're talking about OGs. He was there for a good little while, and he was definitely one of those cornerstones in those early years to me. So I, I got to go with Monty Brown. I agree with you. I think a lot of people don't remember how out of place he looked at times because this is when wrestling was shifting away from the 1980s, 1990s, couple minutes kind of matches, and Monty was on the start of the wrong generation. But if Monty had come around now, where people are looking for more uniqueness in their wrestling and not so, just so much 40-minute-long matches. I think Monty Brown would have been huge today or 10 years prior, but he's still one of those names that I think really had a big hand in the development of the company, so I completely agree with you. Uh, my next one, as, as I adjust the photo, is Jerry Lynn. He's number seven to eight. He's number eight. Uh, one of the first guys to really be like the workhorse guy, you know, you, you put Jerry Lynn in a world title match against Jeff Jarrett and it's going to be awesome. And an X division title match against AJ Styles and it's going to be awesome. Much like Monty Brown, Lynn kind of just missed the boat on being a world champion. And frankly, as much as I love Ken Shamrock, it kind of made sense that you put the t world title on Jerry Lynn considering, you know, he was the first or the last or one of the last ECW champions, you know, before uh, Rhino came in. And I think he even ended up winning the ring of honor world title at one point. So it, it would be nice to see Jerry Lynn get an early run at the NWA World's title in TNA, but it is what it is. He, his legacy is still secure, so I don't think he's, he's missing anything. Plus, if AEW ever let him, you know, he's a lock for the TNA or the Impact Wrestling Hall of Fame. Marcus, who's your number seven? Wait, yes, seven. Yeah, seven, man. Um, for me, I'm going uh, somebody you mentioned earlier. I mean, this guy has, has primarily been known uh, as a pillar of the tag team uh, tenure well, throughout his tenure in TNA and, and, and definitely was one of those names that you always saw and heard about um, made some waves obviously later when he tapered off in the singles and I think he did a, a real good job probably could have shown more improved had he got the opportunity at times but uh, I'm going with the, one of the real OGs the cowboy himself James Storm um, talk about one of those guys who really stuck it out through the best and worst of times through that company they know the way back in 2002 a stint with like you said um who wildcat chris harris yep and doing their thing and then obviously uh it's time to bid money is is you know classic so then i you know super decorated you know, a lot of memorable moments catchphrases you name it he's done it um yeah, man, you, it's, it's kind of hard to talk about TNA and not, not bring up the Cowboys, so that's that's my pick. 
That's not a bad pick, especially because he uh, ended up having much more success after his run uh, with Chris Harris. So he's one of those, he's got a great legacy to his name. My next pick at number, fuck it, (laughs) is Ron Killings. I already forgot what number we're on. Pick. Uh, Six? Yeah. I think so. I, I, I am no longer keeping track. It's hurting my head too much. (laughs) <laughs> uh, Ron Killings is just not, not just a legacy for the company, but for the t- championship in which he won. Uh, he was the first black man to ever win the NWA World Championship, or at the very least, the first one recognized. Um, and he ended up having two runs with the belt. Unfortunately, he ended up getting both belts almost as an afterthought. You know, the Shamrock title win only happened because Shamrock had opted to go back to the UFC, and the UFC apparently didn't want to uh, re-sign him to have the Tito fight in 2002 unless Shamrock had left behind his wrestling. Uh, so that's what ended up happening. Um, the first title run was a lot better than the second title run, while the second title run was more just a, 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 a transitional time period. But his run with the belts, his run with the tag team division with the three live crew, uh, and, and really just his in-ring work in general has been phenomenal. And he still does the beware rap that he wrote in TNA all those years ago. So that's, that's why number six got to be the Ron Killings. Mark is number five. Uh, number five for me, I'm going with a um, super decorated guy. And, and, you know, when I looked it up, and it, it really was no surprise. He is single-handedly the longest TNA tenured um, performer that they had. I'm, I'm talking about the Monster Abyss. Don't go through any footage of TNA and you don't have a bitch in there. If you do, somebody intentionally scrubbed it and uh you suck. <laughs> but uh yeah, I mean the guy the guy has was everything to that company. I mean he he was the monster. He put his body through I mean he basically was their Mick Foley in mm-hmm. a lot of ways. Um and you know, you name it, he did it, you know, both probably definitely in front of the camera but also transition behind the camera. And we got to see somebody who was pretty much done um, in a lot of ways as, as a character and, and certainly in that ring and kind of got revitalized in the other half of his career by literally playing his own brother and joining a faction with seemingly two death clouds. So uh, <laughs> you, don't, you don't talk about somebody who literally hung in there more than, than Joseph Park. Um, AKA the Monster Abyss. So, you know, hats off to the, the TNA Hall of Famer, more than well deserved. So, yeah. His, uh, his best match might be on my top 10 matches, which will come out Friday. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, next up for me, I think we're on number four, is Chris Harris. His singles run was not as impressive as James Storm. And I was going to put both AMW on here uh, just as a tag team. But when I saw James Storm, I was like, oh, I'll, I'll just put Chris Harris on here. Uh, he did have a couple really great singles matches as well. I think it was the 2004 King of the Mountain match was phenomenal. He had that amazing feud with James Storm in 2007. Uh, his work in the company was definitely more tied to his tag team affairs. But whether it's tag team wrestling or singles work, he's always been one of the guys during that time period who really worked his ass off. Um, kind of like Monty Brown, though, there was always something lacking about Harris. With Brown, it was more of the in-ring stuff. With Harris, it's more about personality. Uh, and he never really had a true gimmick that made him stand out other than he was that guy in AMW. But his in-ring work alone and his uh, contrib- contributions to the tag team division and, and, and the fact that he elevated tag team wrestling at a time when no one else was doing it in the world as good as TNA was makes him my n- number two pick, number four overall. Marcus, who's up on number three? Uh, for me, number three, I'm going with somebody who's not an in-ring performer, but for everything that he did, he to me, was just as invaluable as a lot of performers that they uh, have had throughout the company's history, maybe even more so. I'm talking Jeremy Borash, good old JB. Um, from his frosted tips to, <laughs> you know, um, his latter time in the company, you talk about somebody like Abyss who literally hung in there with that company through the best and certainly the worst of times. Somebody like Abyss who, um, I lamented to mention, was, uh, you know, Triple Crown and... Uh, you know, what they call a Grand Slam champion, all that good stuff. Yep. Um, that's basically Bull Rash 
as you know, um, what they call it a multi tool player. He was the ultimate multi tool player for the company for so long. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would imagine there was ample opportunity, probably times that he may have wanted to go, and uh, you know, we uh, he stayed, and we you know, big on loyalty here. Um, and he probably had probably more loyalty than he should have at times, but it was appreciated because in a lot of uh, turmoil, a lot of times when everybody was going and coming and coming and going. He was a constant, and, uh, you know, much respect to him. Uh, yeah, Jeremy Borash, man, you cannot talk about guys who was in that company, talk about who did a lot for it, um, and not bring up somebody like Borash. Like I said, I know he's not an in-ring performer, but for as much stuff as he did, he probably was as vital, if not more so at times. He did have some matches late in his career, so I, I, don't, oh, think, yeah. I, don't, I don't think that he doesn't qualify, if that makes any sense. My number two, or my number one, number two overall, has to go to Ken Shamrock. Uh, he was the reason why I cared about the company in the first place. I've always been a big Ken Shamrock fan, dating back to his days in Pancrase when I was watching bootleg videos of it in 1995. I just think he's a phenomenal wrestler, a phenomenal athlete, a phenomenal fighter, and I can't begin to tell you how excited I am that he's been back in Impact since last year. He's incredible. I think he deserves a world title win. I ain't even playing. Put the belt on him. He'll stick around longer than Tessa. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> when it's eeny, meeny, money, the non-offender, you. <laughs> I mean, think about it. If Ric Flair can win the Intercontinental title at 58 with, like, the body he had, then why can't Shamrock at 57 with the body he has? I'm just saying. Don't be ageist. <laughs> Think about it. In the times we're living in right now, guys like Ken Shamrock and Ric Flair are cleaner <laughs> than some of these people that probably should be world champion, but are getting booted for shitty behavior. I mean, we know Rick's perversion, so like we're not we're not gonna be shocked. <laughs> like we're aware. He's bragged about it countless times. He's divorced five times over for a reason. Speaking of the five times over, let's go with to number one. That's number thing. Ah, that was a terrible transition. Fuck. Marcus, who's your number one? Hey, buddy, you, 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 we got two more categories. You'll get it back. <laughs> um, look, I, I mentioned it earlier, man. He's the reason why I started watching Impact, and and, and, and uh, on the reason why I stayed is probably, you know, uh, watching through, like I said, the ups and downs. Uh, I quickly became one of my favorite performers, and it's probably still one of the best wrestlers going today. He was the guy. Um, and, and was the guy at times when he should have actually been the guy but wasn't um, for whatever reason people behind the scenes I'm talking about the phenomenal one AJ Styles you know like Abyss and, and Storm you do not go through the annals of that company from a video standpoint or even conversation and don't bring up AJ Styles um, I wish you know things could have went differently but it is what it is um, I think things ultimately worked out for him but, uh, yeah, man, AJ Styles was the man. He was, uh, you know, my favorite wrestler of all time was The Rock. But I've always, you know, been attracted to guys like Rey Mysterio and Eddie Guerrero and, and like, the, the cruiserweights and stuff and like that. And to me, he was the perfect blend of, you know, somebody with a cruiserweight style with, like, a heavyweight swag in a lot of ways. Um, and, yeah, it was just cool to see that, that transition. 2009, he found the one strap. That was really cool. And, uh, yeah, he's uh, going to get a lot of mention later on because he has classic moments, matches, you name it. He was the guy in there. So, got you got to, I think you mentioned DNA, you talk about number one guys, you got to mention AJ. And to find out about the later ons, this video is out on Monday. Welcome to Monday. The next one's going to be out on Wednesday. And then the next one's going to be out on Friday. So, tune in Wednesday for our best Slammiversary matches, and then Friday for our favorite Impact Wrestling musical themes. That's what's coming up on the docket this week. F for the references and websites, realnerdcorp.com. Check us out there. We're also on the Twitter at N-E-R-D-C-U-R-P. We are in on Instagram at realnerdcorp. Marcus can be found on his personals at ParadoxKid, P-A-R-A-D-O-X-K-I-D. That's the kid. You can also, god damn it. I was not expecting an accent. 
<laughs> you can also find him on his other podcast, The True Penny Show, at True Penny Show on Twitter, T R U E P E N N Y S H O W. You can find me on mine at Chad Nerd Corp, C H A D N E R D C U R P, and on Instagram at Chad's Photo Hut. Chad Nerd Corp is the Twitter handle, I should have specified. The website's realnerdcorp.com. The podcasts are available on iTunes, Spotify, and Podbean by going to Real Nerd Corp or Nerd Corp on any of those three different outlets, links of which will usually be down below. And for Mark Screen, I'm Chad Porto. Thanks for tuning in to another Top 10. And be sure to leave a like and a comment if you, if you like what you're hearing. Otherwise, we'll see you, I guess, on Wednesday. Marcus, take us home. Good night, me. All right, we'll cut it 2020, 2002. Yeah, it's a palindrome. I like it. All right.